The very first question that I have to ask is why study solitude? Yeah, I think it started out of curiosity. So it started it during my master program. And I think at the time, it was just like, I just discovered that you could actually do research and actually later on get a job doing research for a living. And while I was reading, um, I, kind of, I found, I remember finding this book by Robert Kuhn. I think it's about his journey into the wilderness for one year. And he talked about all like the, you know, there's good parts and there's bad parts of it. Um, so, and then I sat for, found that book and I'm like, oh, this is an interesting issue. So I started reading on it and I realized that actually the academic literature is there's very little on solitude, but there's a lot on loneliness. And even when we started looking into solitude, there's only a few papers that actually try to explore the more positive side, whereas there's a lot that kind of mention solitude and loneliness together. Um, usually either solitude is a component of loneliness. So that just started, it is all started from there, just out of curiosity and started studying it. And luckily having supervisor and mentors that really support me going down that road. Okay, can you help my audience understand what the primary goal is with this research and what you've established so far? Yeah, my primary goal is mainly just to understand what happens during that time, um, what solitude, I think either solitude does to our emotional and cognitive experiences, um, but also like just generally, just descriptively, what happening, what kind of activities we do. And at least in our lab, we try to study solitude from multiple angles because for some people, solitude can just be a momentary things that they have in their day. But there are people who actually like choose solitude as a lifestyle it's, it's a life choice and those are we tend to think of like living alone adults and it can be by choice that it can be life circumstances so there's just a lot of things to explore there so mainly it just try to understand at the more broad level like people who choose solitude and live a solitary life and also at a more like momentary level as well before we get into the nuances of this discussion uh, of this topic, help me understand like broadly, what have you found? Like, is it is solitude in so far as mental health is concerned? What sort of role solitude plays so far as relationships are concerned, performance, that sort of thing? Yeah, so we one of the consistent effects that we found for solitude is it is effect on our emotion. So, you know, if you imagine going through your days, usually, especially if you are younger, you tend to have like a more active social life, especially if you go to university or even when you start working. There are people that you hang out with every day. So that social interaction is usually accompanied with a lot of like, you know, excitement, um, strong feeling, both good and bad and solitude. On the other hand, when we do have those moments to be alone, the consistent effects we found is the down, the down regulation effect of solitude on emotions. So I'm talking about drop in those strong emotions. So positive would be things like excitement, energization, um, kind of feelings that you have when you go to a concert or going to like an event, a wedding, a party, right? But on the negative side, those emotions are also like anger, anxiety, distress, thinking about like um, having a very difficult conversation at work, having a stressful day. So those strong emotion that we usually experience in social interaction, is dro they drops when we are in solitude. So that allows space for more, we call it, low arousal or low activation type of emotion like calm and relaxation but of course negative side that would be boredom and loneliness so so that is the consistent effect we found on emotions and the downstream effect from that is that it can have again both positive and negative effect so you can have like rest 
So rest is also one of the consistent benefit that people have talked about when they talk about solitude. Many people, well, we haven't found whether or not solitude has an effect on creativity that boosts creativity, but many people actually use time alone for creative activities. And both um, people who already, we tend to think of creative individuals like artists, poets, writers, but also like everyday people, they tend to use solitude for things that hobbies and things that like you may use that time to create something. And on the negative side, because of the down regulation effect of strong emotion, over a long period of time, we see a drop in energy. So it can go into the space when it creates this feeling of tiredness and lethargy. Then that has implications for well-being and mental health. Yeah. Okay, we'll go deeper into that. But am I right in assuming that while solitude provides you space to be creative, it doesn't necessarily make you creative, right? At least we haven't found that evidence, no. Okay. So what we don't know is whether or not when people talk, so when we interview people, they say that solitude can be a good space for creativity. But we don't know if these people, these are the people who use solitude for creativity. They could be someone who already have been doing that and then go and you find solitude to be a space that they could focus and do that. And that's very different from actually saying that solitude makes you more creative. Yeah. 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 Like it's shown in the movie sometimes somebody just wanders off into the wilderness and produces like amazing masterpieces. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Understood. Yeah. And the other thing is that it keeps you in a low state of arousal which makes sense emotional arousal but does it help you regulate your emotions so as and when you are you know you step away from that solitary state you are out and about in the world maybe even in stressful situations does being solitary for you know progressively longer and longer periods of time does that help you also regulate your emotions when you are in high stress situations when you are in crowds have you noticed that in your research so let's not talk about progressively yet, and I'm going to okay. explain that part after. But we do, we did find evidence that when people have those strong negative experiences like distress or frustrations, that is when their desire for solitude increase. So now, whether or not then, if they get the opportunity to be alone, which we don't always do because our days is usually dictated by activities at work and responsibilities but if people do get the chance to take that time alone whether or not they can regulate those emotions really depends on the individuals so there's a few factors that we have looked at one big factor is choice and mode like their attitudes towards solitude is because you might feel all this distress moment and you might want to be alone uh, at that moment but you could be someone who see that aloneness to represent that I'm, I'm a not a, I'm I'm a I'm a lonely person. I'm a loner. Um, I'm do I'm I'm alone right now is because other people don't like me. So the motivation behind our solitude matters a lot, and that also the shape whether or not we use that time to kind of feel more like to calm ourselves down. Or it might create also other things like rumination. So that's one of the things that happen when we're alone is we start our, our mind because start, we have a lot of, um, we call, we're more aware of thoughts and emotions that are going on. So a lot of the time it can turn into those worries and ruminative thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to go deeper into that. But, but first, uh, how are you conducting this research? Like, what's the sample size? How's the, what is the method that you're using? I think that would help my listeners get a clearer picture. We generally try to aim for very, like, I'm, I'm not talking, because right now in psychology, when you talk a lot of large sample size, usually we talk about like 500 people. So the one that we conducted in the lab, usually 
we try to aim for around 200, 250 people. And in those studies, typically we bring people into the lab and have them stay alone for 15 minutes. Right now, we are doing a study that increased that time to 30 minutes. And so we kind of, the, the, whether or not it's 15 or 30 is less important, but it's more about kind of try to keep that as a short period of time. Because earlier when I say progressively, when you talk progressively alone, there are a different type of um, design where you can have participants stay alone for four hours to 10 hours. And usually that is used to study more of something we know as social isolation. So so once they are alone, we also make sure to take away their devices because, you know, social media and devices is such a, like it's just such a salient part in our life now. So we take that away. We also take away things like laptop and because a lot of our participants are also university students. So we also take away like textbooks, things that might occupy that time, just because we want to be very careful about the design that we have in the lab to make sure that it's not going to be either confounded by the activities that people do. And then later on, we gradually introduce those elements in to see whether or not it changed people's solitary experience. Okay, so there are dimensions to this, like there's solitude, there's stillness, there's actually being silent. Uh, yes. Okay, so do the results vary? As you can see, there are people who meditate and they can meditate for a long stretch of time, but then they need company. So it, it varies. Do the findings also vary uh, when you sort of add more dimensions to what you're demanding of the research subject? So far, when we explore other, dim- like the dimension, let's say activities, and we add activities like for one, we can have one group that just sit in solitude without any activities. We can have another group that sit with a reading that the participant are allowed to bring into the lab. And then another group, we have them browsing on their phone, but we tell them don't interact because when you start interacting, then it is not solitude. So when we compared between the three groups, we found that the effect that being alone, just the fact that they are alone, were alone in the room at that time, still brought down their strong emotions. So the the effect I found earlier about the deactivation effect is what we um, call it. It still happened for all three conditions. But what is interesting about the the browsing on social media condition is that that condition take away the opportunity for self-reflection. So, you know, to turn inward and pay attention to your thoughts and feeling. Um, Whereas we still found that like people still reflect when they spend time with a reading and when they spend time alone without any activities. Yeah, that makes sense. How would you, like to the people listening, how would you distinguish solitude from loneliness? Have you been, have you established a clear definition of having done this research? So as one of the few solitude researchers, we actually care about that a lot. So to have like that really clear definition, and I think we're getting close at kind of trying to agree around what that is, is the solitude is mainly we think we, we concept like define solitude as just a state of being alone. And the more important component is being separated by uh, from the demands and uh, interaction with other people. So that means that being alone can be physically alone when you're alone at home or in your room. Um, But even then, if you're spending time physically alone, but like talking to someone on the phone, then that is not included in the definition of solitude that we um, study. Whereas you can be in a public space, like in, you know, at a park or in a cafe, but you are just on your own. You're not interacting with anyone around you. So then that also, that is considered solitude because 
the important component is the absence of interactions and demands from other people. But there's there can be complications that can introduce like that later on we need to see what is the effect of the people around you on your the meaning of solitude to you at that time because some people might be in public and feel completely fine were able to focus on themselves um you know sometimes you can be in a very busy place like a subway or in a tube And then you can just put on a headphone and you know that that's your space. But some people do feel that they are being watched as long as they they are around other people. Then they would say that I need like perfect physical solitude for me to experience that. Whereas loneliness, loneliness is, is first off, it's a negative experience. And it usually signals unmet social needs. So like the um, the research on lo- loneliness kind of defines loneliness as the gap between what you expect your social life to be and what it really is. Um, so in that sense, then we were able to distinguish between solitude and loneliness. Solitude can just be a neutral state. It can be a positive or negative state. But loneliness in of itself is signal that like their social needs are being unmet and it either can motivate people to seek out social support or uh, there might be downstream negative consequences. Okay. Have you found solitude to have the positive impact? I know we talked about emotional regulation, but overall when it comes to health and well-being, to when it comes to performance, I ask because in my own life, I've find solitude to be a source of um it's what keeps me sane for me like i spend most of my time alone i get up at 3 30 a.m in the morning just so i can get that complete quiet that silence and stillness and from 3 30 to 4 30 like the first one hour i do nothing i just i absorb the silence it's it's so rejuvenating for me and i i need it but i haven't found very many people like myself when we discuss this topic people are very confused they're like why is she saying that does she not have friends and (laughs) but people who know me better sort of understand that this is her preference but even they are very sort of confused i mean even people who like meditation they they aren't they don't understand why, how I can spend as much time alone as I do. And I spend pretty much, I'm always trying to get away from people. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for them. This is why I, like, I've never met anyone who thrives in solitude as much as I do and who needs it to that extent as much as I do. So I'm very like fascinated by your research. And now I have to ask you, I don't know, if is it just me or are there people who are, who feel nurtured in solitude? No, it's not just you. I think you would feel relieved to hear that because I do this kind of research. So there's always people that email or leave comments whenever we have like a blog post coming out talking about how how they embrace solitude and that is like it's it's kind of like their thing. And one of the things that people talk about to be the positive effect of solitude is the autonomy and freedom that they gain from that because that's the time where you not you don't have to compromise to what other people uh, want to do it's not that we don't want to compromise but it's just that during that time you get to decide what you're going to do during the time and many people also talk about how it's kind of so like rejuvenating so earlier i mentioned on rest so there is a survey with adults around the world, like more than, I think more than 18,000 adults around the world and t- asking people what activities you do for rest and solitude come up as the third ranking activities, like more than 50% people, actually 50, more than 50% uh, of that sample nominated solitude to be, uh, being alone to be the things that they do for rest. But then what is interesting is other activities that they also nominated are also tend to be activities that we do alone. Things like walking in nature, reading and gardening, listening to music. So I think that there's actually 
many people out there who actually find solitude to be something that comforting and rejuvenating for them. Okay, good to yeah. know. Well, <laughs> yeah. we talked about loneliness. We, you also touched upon, as you were explaining your research findings, you touched upon how for some people, um, solitude can, can get a little much. Do you think social perception has something to do with it? Social perception from other people, or do you yeah, mean? Like it's, yeah. I think it's the, your own perception also. Like I said, like the reactions that I get when I get on this topic, and this is like my my topic, like this is a favorite topic with me. I can get very excited, and then I see the look on other people's faces, and they wonder, oh, somebody maybe she doesn't have very good friends. So, so stuff like that. It's how you look at solitude. Like I look at solitude as something so wonderful. And when I meet people on the rare occasion that I do, who someone who enjoys solitude as much as I do, I think this is my person. And so my perception is very positive. I wonder if that makes a difference. I go to the movies alone. It's a rule with me. I never go with people. I go to the movies alone. If I have to shop, unless my mom's going with me, I'll go alone. I don't care how people <laughs> think when they look at me. That's something that is very much a part of my personality, not really caring what anybody thinks. I think, I wonder if that makes a difference. Like to people listening, if you can remove that consideration, would that change your relationship with your own company, with your alone time? So that actually has been supported by research evidence too, is that our attitude, our perceptions of solitude actually do shape how we approach it and how we experience it. So it, if we see solitude as loneliness, as something that might have some negative connotation or it might mean that there's something negative about you, then it, then we kind of, when we're alone, we just find that Oh, maybe other people are thinking, judging me or, and we do internalize how other people will see us. And then we might end up judging ourselves actually. So I do think that, yes, well, I do think, and also with support from our research evidence is that our attitude do shape our experience. And I do think that there's also exists a social norms around solitude that I've is 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 a very interesting question because I think is right now we have evidence saying that actually many people find solitude as positive, but why is it that what you just said there when someone actually admit to liking it, then other people just like a little cautions around that? I think we just I think it just related to this idea. Maybe it just um, it's kind of like those guilty pleasures that we're not supposed to express we're not supposed to say out i don't know man I... i've been called a sociopath for how much i enjoy my alone time yeah. <laughs> i'm well, not kidding in all seriousness people have yeah. approached me and told me maybe you should get an assessment nobody should <laughs> be alone that much and be happy about it yeah. <laughs> so, well, but I think that there's there are there are adults out there. So there's actually there's advocates out there actually. Um, just uh, just to put it out there for listeners who might be curious, is that ad- advocates for single life? There's advocate for living alone, just because there are people who really cherish that lifestyle. And I think that maybe it just hopefully shift those assumptions that you just said. I think maybe now. So society start catching up with the fact that there are like good number of people out there that actually do enjoy solitude. Now, the amount of time depends on the individuals. So we haven't so far found like a perfect golden number of how much time you're alone to kind of gain from it. We actually see that is very a lot across people so usually the negative impact of being alone for too long when you're talking about being alone too long it start kicking in only the person kind of past their threshold but our threshold are all different so threats our threshold of how much time alone is too much very different and some people are actually very comfortable and i have to say i'm one of those people that comfortable being alone for a long time but at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't like seeing other people. So I think that it's time to our soul challenge the assumption that 
liking being alone doesn't mean that I'm trying to push out, push other people away or not wanting to be others. It's just that that those are two separate things that I enjoy. Right. So, but yeah. Absolutely. No, this is such a huge, huge point there because I'll add to it. I uh, see a lot of my friends who get married and they're not completely thrilled about the partner they've chosen, but it's they're, they've chosen a decent human being and they would say things like, it's it beats being alone. And I, I understand that. It's I don't judge it. I get it. But I do know that my comfort with my own company. And I'm sorry, I keep using my own example. I just don't have I'm another so example good. to use yeah. for this conversation. Yeah. But because I'm so comfortable being alone, when I do choose to be around people, those people are my people. Like they're absolutely my favorite people. Because I would rather be alone than be around people who bring me down, who harsh my wife, so to say, who are sort of bring negativity or just are people who I simply don't, like our perceptions, our perspectives are so massively different that there is no common ground in which case i would really rather not be around you because i'm I'm okay with being alone i don't I, there's no problem there there is a it's it's i i see that as a power like it's a superpower you uh it also impacts the choices you make because since you are so comfortable with the world walking away from you you will make the choice that you think is best for you. Even if it invites criticism from other people, even if it means people are going to judge you, you're going to do what you think you want to do, what you have to do, what you think is best for you. So being out there, like creating a YouTube channel, maybe giving a speech and stuff that brings up this idea that, oh my God, what is everybody going to think of me? And that reluctance that it creates, and then you back out because you don't want to be laughed at or judged yeah, yeah, or yeah. someone who is very comfortable with their own company is usually someone who prioritizes their own opinion over everyone else's self-perception over the perception of others and those people are usually i don't know they're bolder i think having said that again i'm the only example i have what i'm using is research that i've read like yours so <laughs> no i no i i enjoy hearing those stories because i think that you know we hear stories and then like the thing is we do have evidence so far to support what you just said is that we found there is a positive correlation so there's a link between the type of personality when people kind of the kind of people who want to live by their own values and beliefs. So we tend to think of that as people who have high self-congruence. Whatever they do tend to be con- like, it's kind of consistent with who they are. Um, an author, I think Bella DePaulo, she called that the non-phony people. That's a, it's a simplistic term to describe that. It's just generally, we don't know pe- people like that in our life who just comfortable being who they are, they tend to be the people who also enjoy solitude. And I have no doubt that they also tend to be the people that enjoy social interaction as well. So like then that kind of challenged our thinking about like, so what if like we actually being alone, as long as we also enjoy being with others, is actually calling to question like some... People might just enjoy being with others, but don't feel comfortable being alone at all. Right? So that's one thing. That's the personality type that we have found. But also, you're talking about how you have your own people, you have your own group, people who you trust. The literature have found that there's a link between a well-connected and high-quality social life is actually one of the predictors of positive time and solitude. Because when we're alone, we have those resources that we can draw on. We know that if something happened or I'm alone right now, but I know that there are people out there who's had my back. I do have that option. I do have that choice. But I just, so the solitude then become a choice rather than the opposite situation would be someone who stay alone because they have had unfortunately suffer from lifelong social exclusion or ostracism so we have found that link too so chronic social um chronic experience of ostracism is linked to the desire to be alone 
but we don't know yet whether or not that actually means that solitude is positive for these individuals. So I think that like they are, even though that you draw from your personal experience, there are research evidence out there that actually can validate those experiences. Do you think that, like you mentioned, that there is, it, although it varies from person to person, how much exactly how much you can be alone? But do you think there is like a limit to uh, how much, even if somebody loves solitude, thrives in it, there would be like a hard limit to exactly how many hours they can actually be alone and have it be healthy? So I think that, well, on average, because usually when people do survey, they just kind of get a sample, just say on average. I think uh, uh, one recent paper uh, that just came out found that the longer period, maybe up to about 75% of your waking day, that is when people start feeling some of the negative consequences of solitude. But still, we have to recognize that when we're talking about feel some negative, we're talking about this like kind of sneaking feelings of loneliness. Maybe I miss some social interaction that I should text my friend or call someone. Uh, someone. Now that's very different from we're talking about prolonged period. So days or months or years. So there are people out there who like and real people and they, they do suffer from those. It's, you know, we tend to name that social isolation or chronic loneliness. So in that sense, then that might have more serious consequences to mental health. Again, depending on how that individual also cope with that time. Because one of the projects we ran was to interview people who live alone. And we see it like a variation in people's responses. There are adults who live alone because they uh, lost their partner. And to, to them, it's more about an acceptance of that life. And, um, you know, it, it is what it is. That phrase actually brought up a lot. It is what it is. So I, this is the life that I, I'm, I'm, um, I chose now. But there are people who have never been married and they have been comfortable with that lifestyle their, their whole life. And they tend to talk about how, you know, they don't, they don't like how they need to compromise or they need to share the space. They feel like living alone, they can do what they want. They can travel when, when they want. And overall, we see across um, the sample is this sense of optimism actually really help people to cope with that time. But yeah, so that that's the finding for that uh, sample with living alone adults. I have to say that, you know, I have spent about like maybe three days continuously like alone with just like an occasional phone call from parents checking in, except for that, like totally alone, no, no television, no nothing, just reading, being by myself, cooking, stuff like that. <laughs> but I will say this, no problem being alone, love that time, really enjoy it. But when then I go back into like be around people that is difficult for me then like prolonged period of solitude makes it difficult to then be in a noisy environment be around people then it's, it, it gets to me a little bit it exhausts me completely so that's that's an interesting point because i think the standing theory is that we all have a set point kind of similar to the threat toward idea that i said earlier we have a set point and usually our set point is pretty sta stable but if we continue to be alone, at some point, it will adjust our set point. And then you find yourself back in social interaction and you kind of find I have to adjust back. So I, I had a similar experience moving to university on my own. And I stayed just two days at home, just like because moving and, you know, just just by myself. And then I remember finally get out and go shopping because I need to shop some stuff for my, my apartment. And the first person spoke to me and I'm like, just like, whoa, <laughs> this is a little, <laughs> I haven't had, yeah. So it's, it's uh, quite interesting. I think it just made me, our mind just readjust itself, like with not that many social stimulation. Yeah. Okay, now I have to ask you, and I think this would interest a lot of people, 
why do you think people struggle so much? I mean, we talked about the perception bit, but that's an external factor, sort of. But why do we struggle so much with it? Just being like, there are people who, I don't know if you, I'm sure you do, you do know, probably do know about the study where people were willing to shock themselves um, just so they don't, they can feel something. When they were asked to be sit in silence, sit by themselves, they would rather shock themselves and be that still and quiet. Um, and then there is this other um, study. I don't know if you read about this one, but there was, it's not really a study. It's just something that happened at the end of a study where someone was kept at a retreat. They meditated the entire time. And when they were done, as soon as that person stepped out of that retreat after several days, he directly stepped into the path of a speeding truck and committed essentially committed suicide so that period of stillness and solitude got to him i think like that's what i'm inferring from that that bit that was shared so why do you what's the struggle like this is something that confounds me um i I don't understand it i think it makes sense that we struggle because you know we we are um a more social species and we do need other people. And I think is the time alone when all of that removed, we do still, you know, when we are alone, we do think of people. We do, you know, people might have some social cognition, thinking about others, and they use those memories to nourish themselves during that time. But the lack of, the absence of social interaction is also the lack of stimulation. And we do need that. So during that time, it's both not having other people, not having the feedback, the back and forth. And I'm talking about interaction because you might spend that time watching TV and we do like that is also a type of, we call that parasocial relationship that you establish with a character. Um, but no, it's somehow, I think the social interaction, the back and forth, being understood, being cared for by someone is very special to us. So because of that, then it makes sense that we struggle. Um, And I think that also when you talk about that study where people shock themselves when they are alone with their thoughts, actually, participants were not in that study, were not giving any other activity. They either just sit there and get to shock themselves. I think That is, I mean, this is a very sensational way to make a point that we are not very good with being alone doing nothing. (laughs) They choose to, they choose a very sensational approach to get to that point. But I think the key takeaway is that we're just not comfortable doing nothing. And we usually want to have some activities to do. Very rarely that, you know, you spend the time I'm I'm talking more than 15 minutes or like a long period of time just sitting with your thought unless you are someone who practice, you know, meditation or um, mindfulness practices. So whereas most people, when they are alone, they tend to do something. Um, Some of us might resort to a more low cognition activities like just kind of sit and watch TV or, but there are some TV programs that quite stimulating and quite interesting as well. Others might want to do something that kind of of more interest to them, something more meaningful. So I mentioned earlier hobbies, a thing that they actually enjoy, um, going out, take a walk, something like also, it's also good to move around. So that's another thing is that, Time alone might also correlate with sanitary time, so time that's sitting alone. And we know that there's there's evidence showing that sitting down uh, for a long period of time is not good for our health. So some people might choose to move around. That's actually that's one of the things people talk about a, lo- a lot during lockdown. Is um, uh, well, I can only speak for in the UK. When we have the lockdown restriction, people do take advantage of that walk that they get to do every day, that nature walk. Um, and how, how many of our living alone adults actually speak very positively of the opportunity to get out there. And the fact that they live near the beach or they live near the wood is really uh, beneficial for them. 
okay but all of this what you've shared it makes you want to consider this put against what we know about anxiety and emotional regulation so i have been on the show i've been told that violence is not escalating it's not true people are not getting more violent so i'm not going to say that people are, because i have no study to back this up i have no stats to back this up so i'm not going to say that but what i will say though is impatience people are more impatient comparatively like in my i'm 32 in my own 32 years i've noticed people are getting people are quicker to like give up on things even if there's a little struggle people are more impatient they want instant gratification and there are a lot of factors of course that play into that but you know there is such a thing as if i'm standing in a queue and i'm getting impatient obviously i don't want to stand in the queue i want to get my work done and go home but i'm i'm not i don't react much i'm like this is a fact of life you have to stand in the queue wait for your turn but there are people who would lose their tempers who would get into like spats and even if they don't get violent they'll yell they'll just generally be obnoxious uh, to whoever is managing the queue like this is one <laughs> not so complicated example yeah. a very accessible example because we've seen behavior like that in our daily lives so Considering that, do you think that has something to do with the fact that we are overly stimulated at all times? Like there is just so much going on in our lives that we just don't know when to just stop and turn it off and get like, take a beat. We'll get to anxiety, but the, the one thing, this is something that really I wonder about people who co- are constantly losing their tempers, people who they Obviously, they want to be good parents. They want to be good kids. They, you know, good to everyone in their life. But they, they just don't have the patience and the tolerance for it. Could the overstimulation be a factor in that? And could solitude help them get to a better place? I mean, I would love to run a, an experiment to test that because I think I do agree that right um, at least from my parents' time, at least from hearing their stories. I do think that we are at a time where there's just so many things fed to us. Things are just so accessible. Things are on your phone. Even TikTok is just those short video that just come at you. There's just information, news from multiple places. And actually, I do remember one time, I don't remember where I were, but I was visiting a new city where I realized that I was sitting at the coffee shop and they were not playing any song. And I was like, this is so refreshing. And then I go back to where I were and then they just play constantly songs all the time. And I'm just like, why can't we just not play songs? And I kind of like the, because I grew up in Vietnam and I kind of miss that just, you know, that vehicle sounds in your neighborhood that just like, but this is not constantly pop or techno music. They're just constantly playing. So I do think that we're, we had the, you know, a period of time where I think maybe, I think it's just something that come hand in hand with the advancement in technology. And that's just kind of something that, you know, part of what societies are now. So I can see how that shift our set point, the set point that we talked about earlier is that if there is a set point of the level of stimulation that we experience every day and talking about every day of our living time, whether or not you're 20 or you're 30, it determines our set point. And when we have those quiet moments alone, then some of God, some of us that might, then that's create a disturbance, you know, a discrepancy in our set point, And we might not feel comfortable with that. Um, now, whether or not people who do have this very actively, highly stimulated life, whether or not they can benefit from it, it really depends on how they can adjust. Because I do think that to go from, you know, overly stimulated, have a lot of things going on, and then go back to go down to just not having a lot going on a quiet lifestyle it might take a little time to get used to so because of that when people ask me actually when I mention people it's actually my mother because she 
was someone who has a very active professional life. And when she decided to retire, she has days that she doesn't, she no longer goes to work. And she did ask me, so you do research on solitude. How do I get better at this? Because she said that she started with trying to be alone and it's just, oh, it's uncomfortable for her. And when I asked her, I realized that she just kind of like try to go for like a whole day. I'm like, well, just, just kind of, you know, like anything you want to build habit, you need to start small. Don't start with something big, you know, you don't go in. If you want to build muscle or exercise, don't go in and lift like your, your body weight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to start small. You need to build it up. So get used to it. I think then the people who have this very high set point have a very actively social life. Maybe they need some time to get used to. So the one thing that we do very well is to judge ourselves. When we start having those negative discomfort, negative feeling, we tend to like, oh, maybe something has gone wrong with me. And that's what my mom did. Like, oh, maybe I'm not good at this, you know. So then you never try again. But I think self-compassion is another thing is to say that, you know, I, I, need, I want to get used to this. See the values in solitude. So that you can like build up that muscle for yourself. <laughs> right. When it comes to an anxiety and depression, this is where I am like I am confused. So a lot of people, like the, considering the work that I do, I get, a lot of people get in touch with me who have anxiety and depression, and they would ask me if I if alone time is something that can help. I actually don't know the answer to that because when I was overwhelmingly depressed and anxious, I needed company I, I that was like the only time in my life when I did not want to be solitary I desperately needed noise and people around me because I, I was also having hallucinations um, and so I, I would seek out company because I needed people to distract me um, is that something that you found in your research because anxiety is basically this a lot of disturbing thoughts, a lot of your mind is going, going, going. Yes. So I think that like the data that is available out there, I could draw from the research on the time that people spend in during the pandemic, during lockdown, actually. And one of the predictors of negative consequence coming out of staying alone during lockdown, one of the predictors was people who have existing depressive symptoms so we're talking about psychological symptoms and also people who live alone so those are the predictors of you know increase in negative consequence from continuously staying in lockdown staying in social isolation so i do think that mental health symptoms it become a risk factor for being alone and I do think that it's, I think it's completely normal to want to be with other people when you don't feel great. And if you do have people that you feel that can be there for you and not judge you for whatever problem you have, that's, to me, that's great. Seek them out. Cause I think that what we don't want is, you know, solitude. One of the things I mentioned earlier for it to be a good time. It needs to be a choice. So, and if you feel like time spent alone become a distress, then it's no longer something you choose. And I think we need to take advantage and embrace the option to reach out to other people. And to me, it's a, it's, it's great to actually have that, those resources because we also know that the research say if you have a high quality social connection with other people, then we feel better when we are by ourselves. So I do think that there are resources supporting that, you know, anxiety, depressions is a risk factor for the time that we spend alone. However, interestingly, I did interview one gentleman where he has social, uh, he was diagnosed with, um, she, he's di was diagnosed with social anxiety. And he chose to live alone because he has social anxiety. But this seemed to be a lot of complexity into that because he was discussing that experience of going into a pub 
um, if if he goes there and the people like all people start filling in, if he's already at the pub and people start filling in, um, coming in, that's fine. But if he goes to the pub and we, he look through the window and he see that other people, too many people in there, then he would just turn around and go home. So I think that we might see social anxiety has a link to this desire for solitude. But what we don't know is actually whether or not social anxiety actually get people to feel okay or happy in solitude. It might out of fear. And we know that when solitude come out of fear, it might have some negative feelings. Now, the question is whether or not the person, because this person that I interview, he actually developed a coping strategies to cope with that his life. And he actually managed okay with the lifestyle that he chose. So I think there's a lot of layers in there. And mental health issues, people who have pre-existing mental health issues, that might in also kind of interact with people developing coping strategies to cope with their mental health issues and somehow enjoy their solitude. Some of that coping might also rely on having um, supportive people in their life as well. But I think there's a lot going on there. Oh, yeah, this is so interesting. You know, this is what I hate. I, ever since I was a kid, I've been enjoying my solitude. Like this is how I was born. This <laughs> I always say this is how my mind was set up. This is the kind of brain I was born with. So I've never really been able to understand. Like I understand because I read, I've been, I have a degree in psychology. I read all of those books. I interact with people like yourself. So I'm always around that content. So I do have, an understanding but I have never felt you know that struggle with your own company that struggle with the quiet time with stillness with silence I hate that I hate that I can't completely understand and therefore offer up answers and there is not as much research out there so I'm that's one of the reasons I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing I'm so thrilled to have you on the show because there aren't we don't have enough answers yet you know yeah well, that's why I think it's, it's so interesting. And I, I hope that the more I study it, the more I can understand. Because I think that for some reason, we it's just a part of our life. And it's actually a pretty regular part of our life. People do spend time alone every day. And there are people like yourself and me included, actually enjoy solitude, love solitude. But why don't we go and study it? And I think that, like, I, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful though that right now societies and our culture start being like opening up to the this idea. There's a rise in living alone adults too, and the thing is, the thing is that's also an interesting conversation because there is so several countries have declared like loneliness and social isolation as a crisis, uh, an ed- epidemic. And then at the same time, we also see the increase in single adult household. Now, when they piece the two together, there tend to be the assumption that, you know, one costs the others. Maybe people live alone and that's why we have a loneliness ed- epidemic. But actually, sociologists, they warn against that making that connection because they might just, Two things that happen because of some other factors. For example, they explain that the rise in single adult household around the world, especially in developed country, um, actually they attribute that to the fact that we actually earn better than the past. So we earn better than the past. And also many of especially developed country, have social services that people can rely on. So right now, na- nowadays, we rely less on having a community and social um, connection to get like food, to get resources. We can rely on government social services. And now I can't speak, we can't speak for all the country. We can't speak for everywhere, but at least that is what sociologists used to explain why there is an increase in single adult 
a household in developed country. Whereas the epidemic, um, uh, the, the loneliness epidemic, also an issue in developed country, it might be due to, some, to something completely separate. It might be due things to social issues. Right now, we see a lot of talking about like in inequalities, stuff like that, social issues that contribute to loneliness. And in fact, when they talk about loneliness and why people are lonely in those large data, we find that There's uh, many factors contributed to it, including people who might have, you know, earlier I, I mentioned mental health issues, but also chronic health issues. So chronic health issues might lead people into being homebound most of the time. And the lack of sometimes the access to social support, uh, to, to social services, we know that is there's an equity problem to the access to social um, social services. Not everyone has equal access to social services. So that also contributes to loneliness as well for people who have chronic condition. People are complex. These conditions are very complex. And this whole conversation about adults choosing to stay single and alone, there's such a massive conversation because there's so much going on there. And I have to share, like when I was volunteering, I had already quit my job. So I was also, I had the opportunity to hang out with my, I don't know if this is PC or not, but wealthier friends, like my friends who were from a certain kind of background, but I was also volunteering at the time. So I was also interacting with people who were suffering in life. And I noticed that a lot of these people on both sides were choosing to be alone, were choosing their own company over everything else. But in the, the, reasons for it were so different and how that manifested what that resulted in was so different like the abuse victims just couldn't trust anyone anymore but the the on the other side the ones like the my friends they were people who had the world at their feet so to say and they just didn't see why they had to compromise but yeah 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 in the alone time with the abuse victims people who were carrying active trauma I found their alone time to actually be more positive because they were constructing something. While with the the my with my friends, I found the alone time to be to be sort of tainted with a degree of bitterness, with a degree of defiance, with a degree of some high highly charged emotions there. And I always wondered if you are creating a sort of identity using that that solitary time. And someday, if that identity does not truly belong to you, it's going to hurt you. It's going to start, like, there's going to be incongruence and it's going to hurt you, you know? Yeah. I feel like it's, it depends on what build up that identity. Because I think that are we alone because we just kind of try to avoid other people? Whereas for some people actually alone, like, You mentioned a few people you're working with, people who have been through abuse and have been negative life events. They might associate time alone with something that is healing, like a space. So there's one study that actually interviewed refugees when they were in the refugee camp. And time alone is actually something that is precious to them. Um, this is a study conducted in New Zealand. And the author was speaking of a lot of the social integration program is all about, oh, you need to be integrated. You need to meet other people. You need to join groups. You need to do all these social things. But for them, like time alone is when they used to create something in that paper. They actually share paintings that people do in refugee camp when they have those time for themselves. And in fact, especially when you in a societies with a lot of people that don't look like yourself and you feel like you are an ethnic minority, be, being out and among the crowds of people that don't share the same background as you can make you feel a little self-conscious and feel like everyone's staring. So because of that, then it they find those moments when they have time for themselves is kind of like a bit of having a sense of like anonymity and also the sense of freedom. So I I do think that that's, that's a very kind of like interesting and 
sweet point you mentioned that like all these people who have been in so then uh, many negative events in their life end up to be the one who actually cherish solitude and that kind of remind me of whether or not also optimism is is one factor is there like to actually seeing positive things out of the things that you do yeah yeah there was something uh, very interesting that one of the like one of the women said to me, uh, she was a victim of domestic violence. And she told me that I've spent so much of my time being hyper aware, sort of figuring out ways to protect myself. She'd been in that very horrible relationship for a long time. And her entire life was about, oh, what's next? Is he going to, like, I, I don't want to go into the details of it, but she told me that I have lived as a victim for so long that now I need to figure out who I am not a victim but who i her her name let's go with a like with a fake name here roma so roma needed to know who roma is when that victim tag gets taken away when she no longer has to be hyper aware when no one's going to come at her and there's no trauma waiting hiding in some corner waiting to attack her she's so her solitude period was actually exploratory she wanted to know what makes her laugh she want, wanted to know what you know, inspires awe in her. She wanted to know what excites her. What's her favorite color? Like she had forgotten what her favorite color is. She didn't know what her favorite color is. She used to wear colors that would just simply not attract attention. She used to dress to sort of blend into the background, which is so sad when you think about it. So her solitary periods were actually all about reacquainting with herself. Yeah. Well, that's that's a powerful story. I think this is is the time where you basically because one of the thing people talk about solitude, they also mention a lot about self discoveries, especially when they ha- went through a difficult period of life, and this is the chance for them to kind of just learning who they are, um, because it's hard, especially if you know there there are people out there who get to learn through learn who they are through interacting with other people but some people do need that time learning about themselves when they don't have all the distraction around them people who especially people who are judgmental or people who might kind of want to interfere with that growth process so i can understand that's true but i i wonder like self-discovery does not necessarily have to like it is a direct result sometimes of being solitary but i wonder if if you can take it on as an intent like for people who struggle with solitude, if you go into that those periods of solitude with the intent of discovering more about yourself, maybe that would help us be solitary because you're not really being inactive. You're very active. You've, you're engaging with yourself. I think that would be kind of cool. So I would approach that with caution. It might be a double-edged sword. And I say that because Let's say if you have never really actually spent the time trying to engage with yourself and then now decide to do to do it, you might not like what you find. Uh-huh, <laughs> you might yes. not like what you find at first. You might not like what you find at first. And we tend to prejudge discomfort. We tend to prejudge those negative feelings that come up whenever we try to find out something. But I think that is is also an opportunity to get used to the discomfort and i think it's completely normal to kind of get into like an unexplored water and then you might find a little discomfort and get used to that feeling so but if that discomfort become too intense to the point that you feel like you need other people then reach out but i'm just saying that don't prejudge those discomfort and those negative feeling Especially when you find out something that you 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 um you don't like when you go through that that self discovery period, because one thing about so that's why usually people speak about mindfulness. You know, one component of being mindful is being ju- non judgmental about whatever feeling that come up. So then, in that sense, I would say yes, it's it might be good to embark on that journey. But knowing that there would be, might be some discomfort. In fact, that the book I mentioned earlier, Solitude in the Wilderness, I think, I don't remember. I think it just became Solitude by Robert Kuhn. When he went on that one year, it's not, the book itself is about self-discovery. 
So we know that we tend to think of self-discovery as a positive thing. But that whole book, there's just so many things going on. There's so many negative things that he encounter in his emotional life. And so I don't, it is, it can be challenging. And I, I do think that if you're up for the challenge, do do it. But knowing that, you know, if something come up, it might just be part of it. It's part of that, um, that journey. Yeah. yeah. That makes so much sense. That also explains uh, the post uh, COVID, the post lockdown emotions that people had, like so many people described it as traumatic, the lockdowns, and then the, all the relationships that broke up, ended in divorce. That explains so much what you've just shared, because so many people were like, everything was amplified for us. We could see things so much more clearly, and we could recognize this other person. We could recognize the person that we have become. That makes so much sense. So I. And I, I do think that like, you know, once that stage hit and then you go through a period when you realize that, you know, th that's not who I am. I don't like that person. And you kind of want to find who you are. Many people actually do that through solitude, through being single and then rediscover. I, I like the word you used earlier, reacquaint. Yeah, reacquaint with you. Yeah, reacquaint. That's a really nice word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's helped me something else, the impact of solitude on motivation, because that's something else that I wonder about. Do you, because if you slow down, you regulate your emotions, are you going to lose your momentum? Are you going to lose your motivation, your ambition? Is that possible? I think it is possible. And I said that th by thinking of that, that findings by a research team where they put people in a room for 10 hours and they found a drop in energy energetic arousal is what we call it drop in energy and we know that we do rely on energy on for our motivation but now i think motivation we tend to think of motivation as this like you need to push in energy to do but it also depends on what type of motivation we're talking about because we, energy is might need source motivation for certain activity um and people during the time so i haven't tested this and i don't think i'm aware of any studies that have tested this is whether or not um the motivation we discovered in solitude might be for something else for certain specific activities because some people do use time alone for creative activities to create something. Now, that is very different from the kind of motivation that we need when we need to like go in and kind of start playing sport and like that need to be hyped up, you know, you need to, but athletes, athletes actually do mention about how they do have those time where right before their performance, they need that time so then they can refocus. So, what I'm very curious about is that we find the effect on our energy, but we don't know what's going on in cognition. And energy might just be one thing for our motivation, but our mind can be another thing. And usually when athletes use the time alone, they tend to engage in this practice of imagining the game before they go in into the game. Um, so. Yeah, so I, I, I think, um, so if, even that question with motivation, I think there's just a lot of things to distangle and kind of like that need to be find, found out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have a lot of interesting questions. <laughs> yeah, this, I told you this topic is like, there's so many, I need answers here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I do wonder about that. I operate at very low energy if, if I, if, like there's a lot of stimulation in the environment. I cannot work. I cannot think. And and most of the people, I, as a Hindu, I know a lot of people who spend a lot of time chanting mantras, a lot of like 14, 15 hours in prayer and just stillness and silence. They're not, they're not really my friends. So I never really had the opportunity to really pick their brains, but they're having like some conversations with them. I found that they also, they are, it's not that they don't have motivation. They are driven, but their drive is very different. And the, what does drive them is very different from what drives other people. 
And even when it's something that has a lot of emotional investment, if they don't get it, their reactions are very mellow. They're very well managed. And even as they're pursuing, maybe pursuing a monetary goal also, they're very, it's, it's, it's very external to them. It doesn't disrupt their internal world. But, you know, you need like, as you said, you need to do research on this. You need like a wider sample. You need more people to talk about this because otherwise I think there's a very real possibility that solitude might negatively hit your motivation, you know? Well, I think the thing is like, I feel like the way that motivation is portrayed in, you know, popular popular media is very, what do you call it? High energy. High energy. It's very single dimension. Yeah. 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 It's very high energy. Yeah, like you need whenever you want to do something, you need someone to hype you up and you need to hype yourself up. But I think that like some people might find their source of motivation something uh, somewhere else. In fact, I would say that like maybe there's a certain time where they, when you too stimulated, there's overstimulated, then you need to reset that so that you can engage with something else. Right. So um, and there are certain activities that just require more focus and attention rather than being like, I think that excited state. I think there need to be like a sweet spot there so that is kind of help with our attention and focus. And I think the connection is there. What kind of that sweet spot of energy that also help with focus and that attention? Um, Maybe I'll try to find time to read more about that. There may, might be, the, yeah. Thank that you. makes so much sense. That's... Yeah, everything you just said, yeah. that makes so much sense. You find out more, you can come back to the show and share with us. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but before we uh, sign off, uh, anything you want to share with the listeners that we may not have touched upon, but any significant finding, anything you want to you know, leave the listeners with and also tell them how they can get in touch with you if they want to, anything you want to plug. I think this topic is very new and I really appreciate that people are curious about this. It's actually something that I'm like, I, I feel like I there's, it's kind of like to in my view, I kind of see it's the wave and I'm riding it because for some reason it's not getting attention and I'm kind of like, Oh, but I think those conversations with you and with people who are curious and kind of maybe the research is validating to them or maybe that's something they have never thought of before it has been very helpful. Um, but I do want to put it out there is like kind of emphasize what I said earlier in terms of if you are someone who unfamiliar with solitude, do consider starting starting small because think of it, don't think of it as anything different from building new habits like if you wanting to from right now i'm actually building a new habit of trying to drink water enough water every day right so then i need to start small not chugging down like a little <laughs> a time so yeah you know you need to build starting from something small build your comfort on it and then um and then another thing is try to think of if we know that doing is more is better than thinking in solitude then maybe start with some activities that you enjoy use that for your solitude if if it's an activities that compatible with the more calm and relaxation is even better actually and if people want to get in touch it's just through the either my personal website or the solitude lab website so it www.solitude like the small dash lab.com yeah just get in touch through there yeah i'm gonna yeah. make sure this uh, these links are in the episode description so we've reached the end of this video thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me the video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation and if you would rather listen to these episodes then you can find experimental podcast on most podcast platforms if you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please. And do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Until then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.